everyone. Um, welcome again to our symposium on wildness, wilderness, and the creative imagination. Um, and thanks for coming to Flyway's Home Voices Reading. We have two MFA students here to read to you. Um, first place winner of the contest is Andrew Payton, and second place is Tegan Swanson. Um, the manuscripts that you'll hear from today were selected by Linda Hazelstrom, and they both appear in the most recent issue of Flyway, which is available in the back if you're interested. Um, I just wanted to remind you as well, we have some events happening um, this afternoon and this evening. So at 2 o'clock, there'll be a panel discussion on travel writing here in this room. Um, at 4 o'clock, Ralph Potts will read. And at 7, Anthony Doerr will read in the sunroom. Um, if you could take a minute to silence your cell phones, that would be great. And books are also available in the hall back there, so please buy some books. Um, so to introduce Tegan Swanson, we'll bring up Chris, Chris Viviora, who's the assistant managing editor for Flyway. Thank you. All right. Like Sarah said, I'm Chris Viviora, and I'm with Flyway. I'm also a first year student as well. Um, another thing that Sarah wanted to mention was the Flyway issue is up and available for subscribers, so if you want to check that out on Flyway's website, that'll be up. Um, so I'm here to introduce Tegan, who's a first year. I'm a pleasure to introduce her, and I'm kind of supposed to do two things. Um, I'm supposed to pronounce something right and also not embarrass her, and I doubt if I'll do both. But um, Tegan's from Rochester, Massachusetts. She went to University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's worked in Washington, D.C., traveled to Ecuador, and taught in the Marshall Islands on Nemeric, um, her island where she was at. And before coming here, and she's the Holgraf Fellow this year. And I got to know Tegan in our nonfiction workshop together. And a lot of writers get described with a preposition, like they write in some certain place or about a certain place. But for me, um, getting to know Tegan's work, it was more a verb, action. She really submerged herself in a place and brought around a reader to a place. And that was in the Marshall I Islands. There's a specific scene I remember in a piece of hers that she's snorkeling around. And then there's these pieces of trash. And it just kind of anchors you there. And it really just pulls you in. Um, and last week, I remember talking to Tegan, and she asked me to read a story of hers. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll read it for you. She said, don't, don't read it for me. And I said, Tegan, not, not you, but because I believe in your writing. I believe in what you're writing about, um, the truth behind it, the place of what you're writing about. So I have the great pleasure of introducing um, our second place Home Voices winner, Tegan Swanson. So please welcome her today. <laughs> Chris, that was very gracious. Um, I guess just to, to introduce this essay, uh, I was writing essays about my, my year in the Marshall Islands in the nonfiction class that Chris mentioned. Um, and this is, this is from one of those. It's actually uh, also the one that he mentioned about the trash, which you'll see in a minute. But uh, in 2008, I spent a year as an ESL teacher uh, on an outer atoll of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Uh, the island that I was on is very isolated, called Nambarik. Um, I was in a program called World Teach, and I lived with a host family, and I worked with students in uh, kindergarten through eighth grade for a year. There's about 130 of them. Uh, so this essay is in April of the school year. And it's called Everything Rises on an Atoll. Snorkeling in an early morning rainstorm, my face encased in a plastic mask, I am surrounded by billowing polyester the color of mango, banana, and ripe papaya. I am buoyant, stuck to the surface of the tamed soup of ocean water which fills the lagoon, the inflated bubble of my Guam dress, floating above me like the nematophore of a Portuguese man of war. The world is tinted and cloudy, turquoise, tinged in salt, 
tepid and lolling. I can barely see my hands as they flounder in the water in front of me. Coming in and out of focus as it moves around the reef, a giant Napoleon humphead wrasse grazes on the dead coral growth. It is bulbous and rainbow bright, a mosaic of flashing blue stripes and yellow swirls, nearly as long as I am tall. In the water below me, there is a cloud of purple moon jellies, a school of bug-eyed scarlet soldier fish, thousands of ephemeral flickering fins. Beside the staghorn coral, a pile of abandoned D batteries is leaching into the lagoon. I emerge dripping, wet polyester clinging to my arms and belly. Searching the narrow shoreline for my sandals, instead I find three cans of Raid, the remnants of a package of ramen noodles, the disintegrating mess of a dirty diaper, half buried in sand. Black flies swarm around the skeleton of a chicken carcass. As an influx of rainwater overwhelms the earth, refuse in varying states of decay is exposed and the sweetness of decomposition hovers behind the scent of wet sand, green matter, and Pacific salt on the air. Nemerik is many things. Pristine is not one of them. Prior to the arrival of missionaries in 1857, almost everything that Marshallese communities used was made of biodegradable local materials. By the time the Republic of the Marshall Islands had regained official sovereignty in 1986, much of this had shifted to cheap plastic imports and single-use replacements. Already isolated by miles of open ocean and without the necessary utilities to dispose of any non-biodegradable waste, Marshallese on outer atolls have no choice but to burn their trash, pile it beside their homes, or throw it in the lagoon. Go looking on the beach or in the mangrove forests of Namrik and you will find plastic diapers, rotting shoes, broken transistor radios, rusted bicycle wheels, and miles of tangled sepia-colored video cassette tape. The ubiquitous D-sized batteries come from the industrial flashlight, which the men use to go spearfishing at night. When they begin to dull, people just toss them aside. After changing out of my son and swimming clothes, I head toward the Moncook to help my sister, my host sister, start breakfast. Although it is nearly seven, I doubt that she is awake because of the rain beating against the tin roofs of Namarik this morning. Lopina likes to sleep late when it storms. The door to their house is open and my 13-year-old host nephew, Woche, is sitting on the bench beneath the overhang playing my ukulele. Warrr, he says in the middle of the song. School is canceled again. Who told you that, I ask, gathering coconut shells into my arms for the fire. The principal rode by on his bicycle, he says. Can you make banana pancakes for breakfast? I raise my eyebrows in a silent Marshallese yes. Go get some from the tree for me, he grins and puts the instrument down on the bench, running out into the rain with his t-shirt pulled over his head. Although I try not to have favorite siblings or students in the community, Woche is both punk rock and polite and he is smarter than most of the young men twice his age. He is the reason I know how to steer a traditional Marshallese canoe and how to play the ukulele. There isn't a steady male presence in our house, so Woche is the one who goes spearfishing for dinner. The girls don't follow him around in droves yet, but I tell him they will someday, and this always makes him blush. By the time he comes back with a bundle of tiny golden fruits, my left hand is covered in pancake batter. We don't have a spoon, and a flat steel plate which acts as the griddle is heating up above the embers of the fire. Every so often, a leak in the roof lets a raindrop on the metal. In mid-flip, I notice that Eteri, my, my host sister's youngest son, is crawling across the coral gravel yard on his hands and knees. Woche, would you bring him in here before he gets soaked? He grabs the baby and puts him on the ground beside me. Wearing no pants and covered in mud, Ethere reaches for the griddle. Will, I say, and tap him lightly on the nose. He giggles and retreats from the fire. When he opens his mouth to laugh, I notice that he is gnawing on something, and I lean over to take it away. When I pull my fingers out, I am holding another battery, rusted at the edges and oozing with baby spit. Outer island communities are extremely isolated because of shipping costs and a general lack of infrastructure. 
and their schools have the lowest education average of the 14 nations UNICEF surveyed in Micronesia. As ocean levels rise, the salinity of groundwater on the atolls increases and plant growth is stifled. Copra production and fisheries revenues are the two largest sources of income for the RMI beyond economic reparations awarded by the United States government for damages incurred during the World War II era nuclear testing. In conjunction with changes in marine ecosystems around the islands, the pressures connected to a resource-based economy increase as these resources grow ever more finite. During orientation, we were encouraged by our field directors to explore themes in environmental education, particularly in sustainable development and resource exploitation. Before I left the U.S. for the year, I had carefully packed a hardcover copy of Dr. Seuss's parable, The Lorax, in the pocket of my hiking backpack. Ten days later, and it is still raining, storms come most often from the northeast, barreling over the lagoon and breaking across the landmass in sheets. Women run haphazardly from their houses in a rush to save their hanging laundry and they send their children skittering like beetles to cover the piles of dried coconut shells which serve as cooking fuel. The highest point on the island is less than three meters above sea level. This means that within minutes of the beginning of a downpour, standing water pools on top of the shallow soil and Namarik is a flooded, muddy swamp. The tin hut that I sleep in faces north, sitting under a pandanus tree about 50 yards from the lagoon. And the window does not close entirely, and I have woken up more than once with a tropical rainstorm blowing in on my face. Navarrecalele Elementary School is located approximately 500 yards from the lagoon, a utilitarian concrete form with two floors and seven classrooms. There is an empty field in the front, which the students use for baseball, and there is an expanse of walking palm jungle behind the building growing around the walls as though the trees are poised and waiting for dark to take back the land. School has been canceled for most of the last week. Heavy rainfall flooded much of the island, downing dead coconut palms and making the single dirt road nearly impassable. Because some of the students live on this part of the island, whenever there is bad weather, the principal cancels class so that they do not have to miss. It's a frustrating policy from an outside perspective, especially when the road condition is not actually bad enough to warrant the cancellation. In the beginning of the year, I tried to have regular session anyway. Very few of my students showed up. When we have rain days now, I invite them to come hang out in the classroom while I work on lesson plans. Sometimes they bring their homework, but more often they come to listen to my stereo and look at the stack of National Geographic magazines that I've kept on my desk. Even the eighth graders have a hard time finding words that they recognize, but the photography is enough to keep them entertained for hours. Regardless of the inconsistent schedule, I have been planning an Earth Day celebration for the end of April. In all of my classes, from kindergarten to eighth grade, we have been using the Lorax to study everything from fractions and world problems to air pollution and geography. The truffula trees that they draw on the margins of their papers look just like the pandanus fronds, which are scattered all over Nambarik, asymmetrical spiked palms in various shades of green and yellow and orange. Today, there are about 25 soaking wet students bustling in and out of my class. Where is the uh, aim? The aim, says Maki, one of my eighth grade boys. He is leafing through the magazines in a corner of the room trying to pronounce one of the words. Spell it out for me, I say. A-M-A-Z-O-N, says Rymus, another one of my eights. It says river afterward. Well, go find out, I say. What color is water on a map? Blue, shout three of my fifth graders in unison. All of the students who are tall enough to reach and several of the little ones who are not run toward the wall to look. Crowded around the map, they are intermingled, Rymus and Maki, lanky like heliophilic weeds, Loa and Risa and Eskiel, nine-year-old bean sprouts with legs too long for their bodies, and tiny six-year-old Selma is a lion-headed dandelion waiting for the wind to blow her in every direction. It says it's in South America, says Loa, as he points defiantly to the map. 
What about the green parts, I ask? What does that mean? Plants, they ask in unison. Right, and what kinds of things are plants? Truffula trees? Selma pops her arms up in the air, stick straight like branches. With mock seriousness, I ask them one final question. And who speaks for the truffula trees? After teaching them a song I'd made up about barbaloo, barbaloots, swami swans, and humming fish, they are ready for this one. The Lorax! The eighth grade boys have gone back to the magazines and are rolling their eyes at the little kids. These boys are tough to reach. Their idols are the elder brothers who have come back from Majuro and Ibai. The brothers wear LeBron jerseys and sink shot after improbable shot from the half-court line on Namaruk's crumbling asphalt arena. They race canoes, they catch sharks, and the coolest ones have more than one girlfriend. They are covered in ink. Most of them are fluent in imitation American gangsta, thanks to a handful of pirated DVDs at the corner store in Demon Town, which is a neighborhood on the Capitol Island. They shave fades and patterns and words into their heads. They smoke and they swagger and they sweet talk every girl on the street, including me. But for some of these elder brothers, the reason that they've come back in the first place is that they've got nowhere else to go. Generations of Marshallese men before them have spent their whole lives on these islands, needing nothing but the reef and the trees that have sprouted from it to feed themselves and their families. These young men will not have that option. Oceanic scientists have predicted that the RMI will soon be uninhabitable, like Tuvalu, Kiribati, and the, Car the Kartra Islands of Papua New Guinea. Groundwater salinity will eat the atolls alive before the rising ocean levels swallow them completely. It is not a question of whether they will have to abandon their homes, but rather when this will happen and where they will relocate when it does. After 13 years of public education, sometimes they still can't read. Others never really got the hang of arithmetic. But the only other places that there are Marshallese communities are in parts of Hawaii, Guam, and the continental United States. Alcoholism is rampant in a generation whose classwork consisted almost entirely of rote memorization and hand copying the outdated pages of moth-eaten 1940s history books. My eights act like they're as tough as their brothers. They have to, just in case. But I think that Rai Masarmaki and all of the other boys who are here, even though it's a rain day, do not actually want to be like their older brothers. Even at 14, they know their time on Namaruk is running out. Do they have breadfruit in Arkansas? Woche, my host nephew, is sitting next to my desk and looking at a National Geographic. His father emigrated in 2004 to work at a Tyson chicken factory, and he has never been able to return. Landlocked Springdale is home to the largest Marshallese population outside of the RMI. I don't think so, hon. He shows me a map of the United States in the magazine. How far away is Wisconsin? I put one finger on the little black star, which means Madison, and another on the one which stands for Little Rock. Maybe 12 hours if I drive, I say. What about if you bike? Can you bring him some guanjin when you go home? It is still storming when I leave the school. Already nearly three inches of standing water on the road, it is deserted and unrecognizable from the dirt path it embodies on a sunny day. Patches of algae have flourished from cracks in the ground like spilled ink. I have no rain jacket, no galoshes, just a simple black umbrella which flips inside out when the wind gets gusty from the ocean side. My toes sink into the silt and I wade to avoid losing my sandals. As I pass the community center, three of my kindergarten girls rush into the road and latch themselves around my body, trying to hide from the rain. I let the smallest of them climb on my back, and she crows when I hand her the umbrella, makes me spin in circles so that the water swings off the fabric and arcs. An old woman leans out of her doorway and whistles at me, her old man sitting just inside and chuckling from the dark. Dinner is rice and what is left of the soy sauce. Because of the storm, none of the fishermen on island have dared to venture to fish from the harsh break against the ocean side coral beds. 
I ask Wilpina why they don't use the reef in the lagoon. The fish all taste terrible, she says, wrinkling her nose as she pops on a cool behind the oven. Plus, the water is lukuntunun. Earth Day on Namarik is postponed by a downpour, which turns the island into a coral stone soup. The principal promises that we will reschedule as soon as the rain stops. Nine days later, ominous gray clouds still hover over the airport at the far end of the island, but for the morning, at least, it seems that they will stay where they are. The mayor has assembled the police force on the road in front of the school, five large, uniformed men holding garbage bags and boxes of rubber gloves. Kids are arriving with their parents in tow. Some of them are wearing costumes, paper hats, uniform colors from the Marshallese flag. It is a sea of white, orange, and blue. The garbage collection is a contest. In a few weeks, whichever team accumulates the most refuse from the lagoon will get to go on a picnic for the last day of class. We have decided to start at 8.30, and the principal is making his way across the field to ring the school bell. Woche and Rymice are standing in the shadow of a large breadfruit tree. I don't see any of the other eighth graders. The Earth Day programs are considered mandatory for the students, but I'm afraid that the older kids are not going to show up. I wave the boys over, and they drift across the yard as if their feet are tethered to the tree. Hey, I say, are you excited? Moche smirks at me. Rima shrugs and says, I guess there's so much trash. Where are Maki and the others? Maki said he wasn't coming, says Rimas. He doesn't want to get his clothes dirty. Without the older students around to lead them, the youngest, I know, will get distracted and wander away. I can only wrangle 127 kids with the promise of a picnic for so long, and parts of the beach look more like the town dump than a tropical paradise. I know from personal experience that when communities are not invested in development projects, that they will only last momentarily after the outside instigation has disappeared. Near the school sits a tractor, which is stamped repeatedly with bold black letters, USAID. Resting in its wheel treads, it has been abandoned since the time the project coordinator left the island. There is a patch of land across the road, which used to be a vegetable garden, that a Peace Corps volunteer started in the 1990s. But when she left, the islanders let the tomato vines rot under a growth of thick purple weeds. If my kids don't care, the lagoon is only going to get worse. And Woche sees this on my face. Hey, he says, look behind you. I turn to see a crowd marching down the road, pushing wagons full of trash bags which have already been filled. Leading the way is Maki and his oldest brother, a 23-year-old named Ronnie. I brought my boys, he says, with his skinny arms spread wide. My little brother tells me there's a prize. What do I get if I win? He has been hitting on me for months, even in front of his mother. <laughs> Adama, his mother, is four foot seven. She has nine children and no time for their nonsense. And she tells me that one of my eighth grade girls has been hanging around their house and asking after Ronnie that he needs some growing up before I should take him seriously. You have to be one of my students, I say. You want to come to my class? He says, teach me everything you know, Ligatu. <laughs> it looks like you know plenty, I say, as I point to one of their carts. There are old plastic rice bags overflowing with the disintegrating, disintegrating D-sized batteries. Can you help me with the little kids? I figured you could use it, he says. I'm all yours. <laughs> he draws out the vowels of his words, and some of his boys whistle, but I don't mind. The great thing about Ronnie is that the other 20-something men will do whatever he says. Thanks, I say, handing him a roll of plastic bags. I guess your mother was wrong. Everybody around us is listening now. He gives me a look like he doesn't get what I mean. She told me you were nothing but a comatorator. The roar that follows makes him blush, but he laughs a little when he starts ordering his friends toward the lagoon, and he even blows me a kiss when he turns to walk away. After they've left, a few of my eights are still standing around. Well, you guys certainly got a head start, I say to Maki. My brother wanted to impress you, he says. It still counts, right? 
I never said you couldn't do a little extra work. Then we're going to win, he grins at me. The students spread out across the beach, climbing into tree roots, wading in the shallows, and digging through layers of rotting leaf matter and sand to find buried, decomposing treasure. As Raila passes into Jota, a small mountain of black plastic bags forms on the road outside of the school. The lagoon side beach of the island is narrow, a four mile stretch of land, but even after hours of work, the difference is hardly noticeable. Even the trash that we have collected will probably continue to rot for weeks in the piles that have formed, waiting for a shipping boat with enough free cargo space to carry it all back to Majuro. Though the capital island is only 80 miles north of Namurik by open ocean, it would be naive of me to expect this pile will be gone anytime soon. I can only hope that the sight of so much in one place will leave an impression and that the Pananis will still remind them of truffula trees when I'm gone. Thanks. Thank you, Tegan. That was really wonderful. My name is Javier Cavazos. Um, I'm a poetry editor for Flyway. And uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone for being here, but also I'd like to thank our sponsors once again just uh, for making this symposium happen. It's a real treat for us as MFA students to have this here. And, uh, and it's just, uh, it's really an amazing experience. So I uh, just want to say thank you for that. Uh, so I've been asked to introduce um, Andrew Payton, who's our first place winner uh, for the Home Voices reading. And uh, trying to think about the best way to talk about it, uh, Andrews, probably to tell you a story about me. So, <laughs> 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 um, I first got involved professionally. My first uh, job as a professional was as a tattoo artist, if you could call that professional. Uh, but you know, becoming a, ta a tattoo artist, you don't you don't go to a university, you don't uh, study books, you don't take exams, you don't write papers. What you do is you apprentice. You, you become a, an apprentice to someone. And, um, and boy, when I did it in the early 90s, uh, and by the guy that gave me my apprenticeship, it was a, you know, I was, I was like the dog, like his dog. You know, talk about a true outlier. Like, a, um, I was the outlier of the tattoo shop. And what happens in an apprenticeship is that you just have to do whatever they tell you. You know, they, they, and, and it doesn't matter if it's even related to the job that's at hand. You just never question it. And if you question it, you lose and you're gone, you know. Uh, so, uh, how does this relate to Andrew? Well, uh, I had a family and I wanted to change careers, so I came into academia. And I wish I would have realized 15 years ago that not much is different in academia from an apprenticeship either. <laughs> uh, so, uh, when Andrew got here, uh, you know, we were looking for a new poetry editor for Flyway, and, and there was a bunch of people. And surprisingly, any one of the people that would have, uh, would have received it would have been more than qualified and, and did it. But I would do little things like that. I will give them little tasks that I would also give to other first year um, MFA students just because I wasn't a first year MFA student. And, um, <laughs> and, and some of them would just do it. Some of them would like do it like the first time and like the next time I came around they would just be act really busy or tell me no, you know, I don't have time to do that. And they're probably wondering what is this guy asking me to do this for anyways. Um, but Andrew always did it. He, uh, he always did it, and, uh, and I can't tell you what that meant to me uh, coming from the, the, the background that I came from. And so, uh, so anyways, I know he's going to make it. He's got what it takes. Uh, he's a wonderful friend. He's a wonderful uh, writer. Most importantly, he lived in Kentucky, which is the state where the great Wendell Berry lives right now. So further ado, <laughs> Andrew Payton, please. Um, all right, so I'm going to read a piece. It's called You're Not Welcome Here. Um, I've cut it down significantly because it's pretty long, um, but you can read it in Flyway, and I encourage you to do that and to subscribe to Flyway. Um, so this, place takes pla this piece takes place in West Virginia last summer. It uh, has two alternating narratives. Uh, one is a 50-mile march I participated in from Marmette, West Virginia, to Blair in a protest of the decision to strip mine Blair Mountain for coal. 
and the dates of the march correspond to a historic march in 1921 known as the Battle for Blair Mountain, uh, where a civil uprising of coal miners fought the company backed by the federal government to unionize the mines. Uh, the other narrative takes place a week later and follows uh, a family road trip to the land where my paternal grandfather was raised, uh, just downstream of the Coal River Valley, about an hour from the, where the march took place. All right, June 18th, 2011, Lincoln County, West Virginia. I keep out of the grass, wary of the copperheads my father warned of, by stepping from cinder block to cinder block. A trailer is turned over into the earth. Rust consumes the tin. A poison ivy rash to come reddens my calves. I make a mental note to search for jewel weed, a natural remedy, when I descend the hill. This is my father's family mountain in the southwest corner of West Virginia. We're here on a family road trip, driving east from Kentucky, in which I've made a temporary home, to where I grew up in the D.C. suburbs. We stopped here to reunite with relatives on the land of my grandfather's childhood. From my cinder black perch, I look out across the treetops. If not for the spruce or firs, I'm only guessing, I could see down to the Guyandata River. And if my family's mountain was higher, maybe I could see out of this holler. Maybe I could see the neighboring Logan or Mingo counties where this river's headwaters are. Maybe I could see the butchered land where once the mountaintops were. Maybe I could see the treeless patchwork of follow stone. June 6, two weeks before, Boone County, West Virginia. We wore red bandanas around our necks. We carried handmade canvas signs bound to bamboo poles with used bicycle inner tubes that read, Save Blair Mountain, Appalachia deserves sustainable union jobs, and end mountaintop removal. Our numbers had grown, and we were upwards of 300 bodies deep. The meandering county highway obscured the front and rear of our single file line. It was the end of the second day of our 50 mile hike to Blair, and we just found out that we were losing yet another of our prearranged campsites. The coal company was literally buying the land out from under our feet. The local papers said we weren't wanted. They said we were a bunch of out-of-staters who didn't get West Virginia, who didn't get coal. Folks came out of the hollers to hold out roses. The trucks, by order of the company, hugged the shoulders. Cars with West Virginia plates drove by singing the horns and cheering us on. Small parties gathered on porches to demand with the full capacity of the human lung that we, tree huggers, go home. June 18th, Lincoln County, West Virginia. I unearth an old shovel, the handle half rotted away, and rest my foot on the spade. I hear an animal, perhaps a deer, crash through the woods. In this very spot, several hundred million years ago, I'd be straddling the equator in the middle of the supercontinent Pangaea. It would have probably looked something like the Himalayan mountains, only taller. This was all created when what was to become the North American continent collided with what was to become the African continent. These are some of the oldest mountains in the world. So old, in fact, that some biologists theorize that this is the birth birthplace of the tree. That would mean that every tree that has ever grown on the face of our planet can trace its family line right back here, right in Appalachia. This mesophytic forest is now so biodiverse that you can find more species of trees in any given acre than on the entire continent of Europe. These mountains are so old that they've already been worn to flatlands once, only to be reborn in a second uplift. During the Carboniferous period, period when the area was covered in swamps, plant life buried in sediment eventually metamorphosed into thick black seams of coal. This age-old rock runs in veins throughout this whole country. At the, end of the at the end of the 19th century, European immigrants and freed slaves migrated here to work in the coal mines. By the early 20th century, the coal companies had become large and rich. The workers, plagued by black lung and dangerous working conditions, were further oppressed by low wages, getting paid in company money that only held currency at the inflated company store. And death was threatened to any who attempted unionization. On the 1st of August in 1921, Sid Hatfield, police chief of Matawan, West Virginia, and famed supporter of the United Mine Workers Association, left the McDowell County Courthouse with his wife and another couple. A group of coal company agents opened fire on the group, filling Hatfield's body with 17 bullets. Armed miners started to gather from all across coal country. They aimed to march through Kanawha and Logan counties all the way to Mingo to unionize the mines by force. Anti-union sheriff Don Chafin's private army of hired goons planned to cut them off on Blair Mountain before they could make it to Bloody Mingo. The men carried squirrel guns. They wore their military union uniforms from the First World War and tied red bandanas around their necks. As they marched and violence grew, 
the coal company opened fire on camps of women and children and hired private planes to drop homemade bombs on the marching miners. By August 25th, more than 10,000 miners had joined the battle on Blair Mountain. The fighting went on for five days until eventually President Harding threatened the miners with federal troops and army bombers. It was, and still is, the largest civil insurrection since the Civil War. United Mine Worker membership plummeted after Blair, and not until FDR's New Deal 14 years later did the miners get the right to unionize. Ninety years later, after being added and subsequently removed from the National Register of Historic Places, Blair Mountain is slated for mountaintop removal. The mountain will be literally and symbolically removed, its social and historical significance erased, its ecology permanently altered. Mountaintop removal, or MTR as it is commonly referred to, is a highly mechanized process of coal mining in which the forest is log, logged, the surface is precision blasted, the summit removed, and the coal seams harvested by massive machinery. The refuse is then dumped into nearby valleys burying streams, and water from the refining process is stored in so-called sludge ponds. It is efficient, it is cheap, and it is quick. It requires far fewer jobs than traditional underground mining, and it has, in some ways, lowered energy costs for American consumers. Opponents of the practice say it is causing irreparable damage to Appalachian ecosystems. Already one and a half million acres have been surface mined and 500 mountains in central, Appala central Appalachia removed, leaving behind topographically altered, toxic, and unusable land. Proponents argue that it is good for our economy, safer for miners, and necessary to supply enough energy to meet our growing demands. Mountaintop removal currently accounts for only 6% of our national supply of coal. In the past three decades, the workforce in Kentucky coal mines has shrunk by 60% due to the reduction of underground mines and the ascension of MTR. I descend the hill, back down the old road, and return to my family. They are still gathered in the graveyard that sits at the entrance to the family land, a hundred or so acres stretched up this mountain and down the other side. In the graveyard are 150 years of names on stone, miners and farmers, veterans and stillbirths, immigrants and indigenous. My, father puts his, my brother puts his arm around me. Hey, Andrew, what kind of tree is that? He directs me to the right of the shack. It is old, fissured down the middle by rot. It could easily be climbed. Surely 70 years before, our grandfather had climbed it. I have no idea. My brother lifts himself onto the porch. Sumac pushes holes through the planks, and hickory nuts decay where they land. I follow him inside. The floorboards of the old shack creak. Grime and spider webs filter sunlight through window panes. My brother wipes the dust from a picture on the wall with his fingers. It is our great-grandmother, stern-faced and bent in age, surrounded by a few of her grown children. Their clothing suggests the 1970s. The tone of her skin proves Creek Indian blood, which has, after two generations of bleaching, filtered down to me. I cough up the dust we'd un unsettled. My brother finds an old rag and uncovers picture after picture. Faces return to their old home. A small square television with aluminum foil antennas sits on a table. He cleans its screen, too. I move into the bedroom cluttered with boxes and clothing. Tears in a large mattress reveal metal, the metal springs. Through the window, I see my parents talking in the graveyard. June 10th, Boone County, West Virginia. Ten miles more and we'd be in Blair. We approached the Logan County line, and the forested roadside opened into a series of lawns and isolated houses at the foot of the mountainside. Ahead of where I marched, an overweight man in a neck brace stepped off, stepped off his porch and lumbered towards our line. His head was down, and since he wasn't yelling, I guess he meant no harm. By the time he crossed his lawn, my point in the march intersected with him, and he fell in line right in front of me. He had a thick gray mustache, a red bandana around his neck, and a lunch pail swinging heavily from his right hand. Within 15 minutes, his back was covered in sweat. His pace slowed, and I feared for his health in the near 100-degree heat. Sir, I touched his shoulder. Do you want me to carry that for you? No, I got it. I let a moment pass, and he continued to drag. There's a van following along with us. If you wanted to ride in it, you could. No, he was curt and short with breath. I got to do this for my papa. Was he in the battle? Shot in both legs, he huffed. Crawled two days in the creek bed back home to Sharples. He pointed out across the field to a creek that ran through the trees. This man was Charles. Charles was a coal miner for 30 years. And the last half of his career, he was specifically in MTR. He was the guy who pushed the button that blasted the earth away. I feel ashamed, he told me. His shirt was soaked every conceivable bit of it, with sweat. I undid God's work. It ain't right. It's not your fault. Yes, it is. A commotion started to trickle from the front of the line towards the back where we were. Someone pointed to the roadside, to a rock wall ten feet high, turning to those walking behind, and said, Jesus Christ. Water trickled out of the trees down the wall and into a small ditch stream. It was the color of a deep rust. 
It hung on the walls like melting copper and ran, fed it in slow, in the direction we traveled. It looks like blood, someone said. It looks like metal, someone else said. Charles said nothing, his head, his head down still. A pickup slowed its pace. A man in the blue jumpsuit and reflective orange stripes of a coal miner put half his body out the window. I see you, Charles, the man grinned. Charles said nothing, just struggled along. Don't think I don't see you, Charles. I last spoke to my grandfather the previous summer on an obligatory visit before his death. He was sat in a metal folding chair at the edge of his garden in Baltimore, Maryland. His camouflaged jacket hung loose on his thin frame like his chin hung loose to his jaw. My father and I had just finished picking stream beans under, the unwavering, under his unwavering guard. Inside, my father was rinsing the beans for dinner, and I stood alone with the old man. He looked through me and into the woods. I planted that tree. I followed his gaze. The black walnut. He pointed out a few oaks, chestnuts, and apples as well. His speech was slow, and his throat sounded like it was stuffed full of cigarettes, 80 years of them, all burning at once. He told me how he would search for ginseng and sell it to the Chinese to buy candy. He told me how his mother taught him to make medicine out of wild herbs and mushrooms, how they raised pigs, how his father taught him to hunt raccoons and squirrels, how there weren't any deer in the mountains then because the Cherokee had nearly cleared them out selling skins, how they collect wild honey by cutting the hive out of the tree, and what he didn't tell me, I invented. A boy half raised half wild in the unending forest. In a poor, less industrialized time, he learned his place with an intimacy that I will never have with a piece of land. A few months later, I was drinking with some friends at a cabin in the Kentucky woods when I got the call that he had died. It was winter, and it had just begun to snow. I grabbed a bottle and walked straight out, th out the door, down to the frozen banks of a drained reservoir. Pools of moonlight collected in little islands of water. I kept my mouth wet with liquor and watched the snow burden the branches of trees. June 10th, Blair, West Virginia. When we got to Blair, it was hardly there. A town that had once, once had a few hundred families was now a modern-day ghost town. A few families, all on their porches, held signs of one form or another. Go home, tree huggers. Welcome, marchers. Coal keeps the light on, lights on. Save Blair Mountain. Proud coal miner's daughter. Thank you. We are so proud. You're not welcome here. The town once stretched up into several valleys, we were told, but those old homes were bought out and buried by blasted rock. The advent of MTR cut jobs and towns like Blair all through these mountains were slowly eroded away by an ongoing exodus. And it's what the coal companies want. When the people leave, there is no one to stand in the way of the whole region becoming one massive coal mine. We camped, hundreds of us, and by morning a thousand, in the shadow of the mountain itself. Finally, Blair Mountain. Among the many forested hills, it was nothing special. And if not having been pointed out to us, none would have taken particular notice. We turned the abandoned churchyard that 90 years before had served as a field hospital into a transient tent village. That night, in full moonlight, we square danced barefoot over loose and sharp pieces of that infamous black rock. We formed long lines with dozens of couples that stretched the length of our tent village. We laughed and shared secret flasks and almost forgot the unblinking eye of the red and blue lights of state troopers perched on the highway above, waiting for morning to come. Blair Mountain watched it all. After a rally and hundreds more marchers swelled our numbers, the last few miles commenced. The actual battlefield was proper property of Arch Cole of St. Louis, so the march was headed for a public turnoff on the highway. However, a group of us, myself included, taking up the rear and numbering just shy of 200, made the decision to go all the way to the battlefield. We took the one-lane highway despite the protest of police. We were loud and strong, emboldened, curving up the mountain highway. I couldn't see the start in front of me or the end behind. We were a presence that could hardly be ignored, triple the population of the struggling community. Local and national networks had cameramen running back and forth our line. When the roads diverged, a bamboo pole with two bandanas waved left to right, the signal, and we broke away from the march. We marched to a green gate that cl clearly marked private property. The cops weren't aware of this divergence from the main protest, but CNN was. We jumped the gate. A reporter asked us how we felt. A roar went up through the ranks. The road to the battlefield was, was edged in blackberries that we picked along the way. Someone from the back started up a song, a civil rights traditional. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. At this point, this far into the week, we all knew the words. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching on to freedom land. There were ramifications of our trespass we knew, anywhere from a night to, night to six months in jail, a fine anywhere from a hundred bucks to a few thousand. It all depended on the judge. Many of us had priors. Most all of us were broke. 
Some, of, some had fi- jobs and families to get back to. So we decided we'd go to the battlefield, but once the police came, we'd turn and go home. At the top of the ridge, closing in, a view through the trees open to our right. Mountaintop removal in progress. It looked like a Wyoming plateau or something out west. Nothing like, I, nothing like what I knew Appalachia to be. Stretching into the distance, the land had been flattened and the ridges removed. It was brown, dry, and windswept. The coal companies claim all MTR land is reclaimed and repurposed. There was no purpose about this. Everything that lived there was gone. People, animals, trees, all gone. It was then that it finally struck me. I might be one of the last human beings to ever walk on this mountain. Blair Mountain, the very ground we were on, was next. Once passed, an organizer turned and held the march until we gathered into a large circle. We have entered the battlefield, he told the group. Let's have a moment of silence to recognize the history and struggle that this mountain represents. Our silence only lasted a moment. Five officers, two state and three county, broke through the crowd and into the middle of the tiny vigil. Everybody back down now, one boomed. Each had dozens of plastic handcuffs hanging from their belts. We didn't move. We stayed quiet with our heads bowed. Everybody move now. The organizer spoke to him in a hushed tone. Is it all right if we just have a moment of silence? Down now, screamed another officer. He grabbed bodies by the shoulders and pointed them downhill. We started to move sullenly back the way we came. Plant your signs, somebody called. We thrust our bamboo poles into the ground. Save Blair Mountain, stout mountaintop removal, into the dirt along the path. Someone else started up another song. Woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The police herded us down, down the mining road, past the gate, and miles on back to Blair. We slept one more night in Marmette, and in the morning started catching rides in various directions across the country. Our mat- march had made some national papers, but a new day of news had come, and our struggles fell out of the spotlight. The organizers promised that us that the fight was not over, and they still needed our help, but the high had ended. The mining continued, and we returned to our lives. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you're interested in subscribing to Flyway, there's a table set up in the back. Um, Also, the symposium authors have books for sale out in the hall. And we hope to see you later on this afternoon for the panels and readings later today. Thanks so much. 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 Thanks so much.